Hey, welcome everybody. We are um, bringing to you right now for four of directors from Allegheny East Conference and 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 uh, Attorney Doggett. I just want to thank you so much for putting this idea together so that um, there are churches that simply do not have the ability to get to Sabbath school. And we just wanted to use this forum for Sabbath school and also a great 30 minute word after. So I, um, I just, I'm just inviting everyone here now that even if you're on Facebook, social media, whatever you, where, what, whatever uh, entity you're on, just to share it right now, take the time out to share it uh, so that uh, everyone could know uh, where we are, especially in this um, coronavirus uh, epidemic that we're in, or pandemic that we're in, we just want everybody to feel comfortable that Christ will always be with us and never leave us. So here on this panel, as you see, see it all, I want to start with, uh, Jack, if you will introduce yourself. I'm Jackson Michael Doggett, Jr. I serve as General Counsel and Public Affairs Religious Liberty Director for the Allegheny East Conference. I am so happy to be in this Sabbath school group today. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Pastor Dave, Dr. Dave, please. Hello, my name is David Defoe. I'm the religious, um, religious liberty. I'm the relationship <laughs> ministries director <laughs> for the Allegheny East Conference, which covers family, men, uh, singles, uh, parenting, mental health. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And Sister Gibson, Sister Poole. I'm Cynthia Poole, Women's Ministry Director and also Associate Superintendent. Um, I like to think that my ministry serves from the cradle to the grave. Hey. And Sabbath school is my favorite part of church. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Awesome, awesome. And again, I'm just, I just want, before we pray, I just want everyone to press press share, make sure you share this uh, and that it'll get out there to the masses, especially those who are used to going to Sabbath school and cannot go to Sabbath school right now, we're bringing the lesson to you. So let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes for prayer. Let's move uh, in the direction that God wants us. And God, you're just awesome to us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity of being able to share the lesson these couple of days that's put together to, for the worldwide church and for the gospel ministry. We ask you, Lord, that someone may get something from this and that um, our souls may be uh, one and hope alive in you, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Amen. So we're just gonna be rolling through the days. I, um, I, I love the way this starts. It talks about from dust, from dust to stars. Wow, so just like you just talked about from the, from the uh, cradle, right to the to the grave just as you talked about it's just amazing that we can draw that same parallel by looking at from the dust to the stars anybody uh jack just when you hear dust biblical term genesis what comes to your mind immediately well immediately i think about when god stooped down into the dust to create adam mm -hmm. and from adam he created eve and breathed into them the breath of life. So I'm thinking from dust that Christ looked at the smallest thing to make his greatest creation. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. Wow. Okay, man. boom. <laughs> yeah. okay, huh. thank, thank you. I wasn't expecting that, but thank you. It, it, and that's awesome. From the smallest matter to the greatest thing. And so, Dave, when you start thinking about dust, Talking about end time now, uh, what, what, what comes to your mind? Now, he's talked about life. Sure. He's talking about dust. What comes to your mind? It, it's, it's the removal of the finality of, uh, of death. It's the, it's the possibility that there lies something beyond, of course, because, you know, we, we, we put people ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and we return back to the dust. But that, that's not the end of the story, that there's more. And Daniel 12, you know, inspires us with the more that is to come. It gives us the hope that, you know, dust is not it. We don't just live this life um, one time, but there is something after. Um, there's, there's more. Wow. Uh, Miss Cynthia, I just want to uh, uh, throw you in on this. Um, Jack said it from, from the, the smallest matter, you know what I mean, to something great. Dave took us, of course, to the finality of death and something more coming. Uh, add your two cents in on this piece. Well, when I think of the dust, uh, beyond the smallest matter, 
it's the most insignificant person or somebody who feels they're the most insignificant person, no matter your rank, your station, dust. We're all dust to dust. Wow, wow, putting us all like on a, this equal, uh, this, we're all equal right across the board. And, and, and grateful to know, it almost brings back this song, um, the many that sleep and the angry deed will be, will be brought back to this life once more. We have to have this hope that there's something else coming. There's something else that's there. I mean, look where we are right now. I, I know, uh, Pastor Dave, that you have, that you, 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 you do counseling, et cetera. And of course, without giving up, you know, names of, of people, do you have anyone in your group that you counsel that, that feel like this Corona thing is the last, last of them, or or this is a doomsday type thing. Have you heard anything of that nature? Oh yeah, of course. It's not not even just in clients. Even with talking with colleagues, that uh, there's some great anxiety or some great fear, um, and the there is some rationality to anxiety. Not all anxiety is irrational. Um, you know, for there are a lot of people who are afraid and there's reason for this, this temporal body for us to be afraid because for some of us, uh, this could be, this could be our time to return to dust. Like the reality is we may die. Um, but that anxiety that we have is not rooted in Christian faith and belief that, and we'll get to it in Daniel 12, one, uh, that there's a time coming where, you know, I don't want to jump the gun, but no, Jesus, go ahead. Go that, ahead. That, that, that Michael will stand up and it'll be over and, and it, you know, the pain and the suffering, but, but we'll, we'll get to it. But there's, there's reason no. for the anxiety and the, the anxiety I, I, is prevalent. But I want you to stay there because that's where we're going. That's, that's literally the place that we're going. Mm -hmm. um, um, Dr. Jack, do you see, uh, do you see where hope sometimes is lost? Uh, um, in between the dust and what our hope is? Do you see that hope could be lost? Uh, are, are you getting that experience out there in Mississippi? I'm gonna come to you as, even with our school system. Yes, um, people, it, when people are under pressure and they're asking God to do a specific thing and God doesn't seem to be doing it, sometimes we lose faith in the God who loves us more than we love ourselves because all we can see is our little cocoon that we're in, that we're trying to survive in. But uh, the text here, Daniel 12, 1, reminding us that Michael or Jesus is the one who, who intervenes in our behalf at the right time. Some, and we don't understand everything because we can only see what we see. Right. But God has a big view of everything and he guides us through the best path. That's why one of the uh, quotes that I like from one of my favorite writers is, if we could only see the beginning from the end, we would not choose to be led any other way. Wow. So uh, yes, there's pressure, there's anxiety, there's desire that God would do a specific thing. Mm -hmm. Shield us from coronavirus. Don't let any of my family die. I've already had family who has died from the coronavirus. I've got another family member in intensive care right now. I don't want them to die, but God knows best. And I'm going to go with him because I know he will intervene. And Miss Cynthia, by the way, I want to go back to timing. When, when, when Miss Cynthia is finished, I want to go back to timing with what you just said. Go ahead, Miss Cynthia. Okay, when, um, when Jack mentioned about the fear and Dave mentioned fear, yeah. what I thought about was, you know, right now we're dealing with that, even with the school system. Let's just take it there. Um, interestingly enough, all the school systems around the nation, they're shut down. We're still going on. And I kind of equate that to no matter what's happening, God is still gonna provide for us. We get caught up in the circumstances. He's got the whole picture. And Jack, like you were saying, he's not really concerned about our comfort. He just wants to save us and it doesn't matter what he has to take us through. If that's our desire, he's gonna walk with us through it and that's gonna be the end of it. Can I, can, can, awesome, can I go back? I don't like what you just said, but okay. We're not gonna be comfortable. 
it, you know, so, so let me just back up just a little bit because you were just talking about the right timing, Jack. Um, we were talking about fears. Um, am I not a Christian then? I'm, gonna, I'm going all the way back to Daniel 1. Because remember, every time, all the way through Daniel, there's always some kind of evil emperor or some, some, some kind of evilness that's jumping in. And that's when, at the right time, something happens, right? At the right time. But during this time, am I less than a Christian? This is Pat Graham talking to my three friends here. Am I less than a Christian um, because I've lost, uh, losing the sight of, 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 of Michael. Can I jump in here? Go ahead. If I said yes to that, then I'd have to ask, was Jesus less than a Christian when he was hanging on that cross and said, Father, if there be any way, take this from me? Uh, uh, yeah. Some doubt. Uh, some some doubt. I, I, I think the, the direction I'm going into is the three Hebrew boys, right? Daniel, um, um, when, I, when I think about when they said, I'm not going to eat from the king's table. Let's talk about behavioral, behavioral type things, Dave, the behavioralists, all right? When, I, when, I, when I'm looking at them saying, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to eat from the king's table, was there some doubt? Or is there something there? Or, or, or then again, if you even take it from that angle, what can they do to know that um, in the fiery furnace, there's going to be four in there? You, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? I know we're going from one all the way through, but how, how do they know? <laughs> because, and let me just say this real quick before you, before you say something. Because Jack said, I have family that has have the coronavirus, right? Um, I put up a joke on Facebook of, Positive, negative, positive for this, this, that, and the other, but negative for coronavirus. And then I took it down because now the president uh, put out, he put it out, so I can say this publicly, he put it out that he has, he has contracted, contracted it. I took it down right away because now I know somebody. The president of Northeastern. Not I'm yeah. sorry, the president of Northeastern, to be direct. But I took it down because now I know somebody. You understand right. what I'm saying? Now it's actually hitting home. Um, Dave, behavioralist in this. The, the funny thing, the funny thing, right, about, about how we exercise our faith and how we look at the timing of God, because time is very important. Da right. Daniel, is, da Daniel, Daniel is fixed about time. Right. We, we, right. We, we think that what we do is we tell the God who's the progenitor of time, who originated time, who made time before time, outside of time, mm -hmm. to then act on our time or mm -hmm. act within our time. And it doesn't really make sense. Um, so yeah, we lose faith. Yeah, we lose heart because we forget who holds time. And and to 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 God, uh, you know, the time is fleeting. It, he doesn't exist on our time. So he sees purpose. He sees future. He sees um, his will before he sees the time that we spend or what we're going through. And I, I think that's what, I think that's what the three Hebrew boys were faced with in the fiery furnace that here they were going through this, this tough time. They were going in their life was coming to an end and here God steps into time at, at the right time for them and rescues them. And that's what it's all about is that, you know, in the midst of our trouble, he's, he's going to at the right time in the fullness of time, as he did when he came the first time in the fullness of time, he's going to come back. Well, I would like to put one more word in there Go about ahead. those Hebrew boys. One of the things I liked about them was their boldness. And they told the King, we're not careful to answer you. And basically whatever you do to us, we're still going to follow our God. And if he doesn't save us, okay. we're still going to follow him. And that's the attitude I think we need to develop because it's sometimes hard to develop. The Bible says he knows we're just dust. And, and we, we do get weak. There are times when we're discouraged. There are times when we just can't see how God's going to work this out, and how is this situation good for me at all? But over our relationship with him, when we see his love for us, we begin to understand that everything's not going to be the way we design it, 
but it's going to ultimately work out for our good. Okay, uh, now I'm going to ask a crazy question. You know, we're still doing a lesson. We're all the way through the lesson, but I, I, I don't, I, you know, if I, I want how, I, th that's what I'm throwing out to you now. I mean, you're saying it, preachers. You're saying it, educators. The question is, somebody is listening to this that's going to ask the question, wait a minute, but how? How, how, how do I stay on this, this, this straight and now? I, I know, I know, Jack, what they said. I know you know, I know what to say during the right time, you know, as an educator, as an attorney, as a counselor, you know what to say. The question is, how do we behave towards that? What is it that we have that, what can we use that's inside of us? I'm sorry, not inside of us. What can we use to bring us to the point of, of raise faith and hope? I got to the point in my life where I was deciding whether I was going to stay with God or not, because there was a specific thing happening in my life, and there was nothing I could do about it, and I knew God could, and he wasn't doing it. So I got to the point, I had to ask myself, am I going to stay or am I going to go? And when I got there, I looked around and said, where am I going? <laughs> There, there's really nowhere else to go. And I look back over my life and the things that God got me through. I, without him, I'm not going to make it anyhow. So I'm putting my trust in him and just letting it, let the chips fall where they may. So then there has to be some type of previous engagement with God before that gives you that hope. Cynthia? Yeah. When Jack said that, it reminded me. Jack, the year I was 30, I remember telling God, I'm going to give you one more chance. Mm. You're either going to come through or I'm walking away from this. And I had to stop and catch myself. And then from then I started realizing all the things God had brought me through. And I guess he said, oh, this silly daughter of mine. But he kept showing up and showing up every little thing. You have to have, you got to take a memory check. That's the only thing that's going to bring you through. Because when you're in the right now, you got to be able to remember what he brought you through before, or else you're not going to have the faith that he can do it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, judgment. Can, can we, can we, can we kind of scoot over into judgment for a second here? Because when Michael stands up, it's not just, for those of us who are faithful, but it's for those of those of us who might have lost our way. Goes both ways. Michael standing up. You've been in the courthouse, attorney. Um, when it's time to stand up, something is something is happening. Because I want to take us from him standing up to us being sealed. Right? It's got to be something that follows that. Uh, right? So. I know we talked about time, Pastor Dave. We all talked about time. Let's move from time to him actually standing up. What's going on when he's standing up? All right, we got it. Let, let, let me just give everybody a, a kind of a overview real quick. I like what we said when, when, when we gave our personal testimonies of, you know, who are you? I'm taking care of you. I'm God. I'm taking care of you. So who are you? I heard from uh, Pastor Dave when he says he's going to get up in his own time. But the day that he stands up, or as he's standing up in all of our situations, but when he stands up, as Daniel is looking for, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? And you can play it out. You don't got to play it out biblically. But what's going on with him standing up? I'm, 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 all, I'm almost on the judgment side of it. What's going on? Oh, well, by the way, judgment is good. Every time we hear judgment, it's not necessarily negative, right? right? Judgment is a good thing. So, 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 so someone unpack that for me. Unpack that for me. Well, Satan has plunged the inhabitants of the earth into one big, great final trouble. And Satan is trying to show that, look, I'm in charge here. And, and Michael gives him his time, but then he says, this is enough. Let me get up. And those who believed you can go with you, but those who believe me will be with me. So uh, 
we, in my view, this coronavirus is a reminder that this earth is not our home. It, it's where we are, but it's not our home. We look for a city whose builder and maker is God. So our name is supposed to be written somewhere. Go ahead. I, go ahead. I, I, just one more. This stand. This 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 Jesus standing up is has always. We've seen it before. You, you know, Stephen's in a pit, and Jesus, who at that time was seated at the right hand of the Father, now stands up. He sees Jesus standing up. At the, right. This has always been about rescue. So not just about judgment, but also about rescue. That 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 that. Um, God's going to shelter us through the time of trouble for those of us that believe in him to the end, that he's going to come and he's going to rescue us from this great time of trouble. So not just, not just judgment, but also the promise of rescue, the promise of, of recompense, the promise of restoration. All, all those things are, are hidden in, in, in that standing up. Is, is, it, is it, Jack, what you just said just now, when you said this is not our home, it's almost like a rescue from us being too comfortable here. It's, 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 it, go ahead, Miss Cynthia. I, saw, I see you. And I'm just going to, it's sort of like he's standing up, but my joy is he's standing up as my lawyer, but he's also the judge. I'm good. I mean, we have to win. <laughs> I'm good. That's the beauty to me of God. He has rigged everything in our favor he really has and for us to be lost and it's hard for some people to believe this but for us to be lost we have to fight to be lost we really do because god loves us so much he has rigged the game so that we'll make it attorney it, i'm coming dave hey, attorney i in at the end of my bio it says it is easier to be saved than lost Yes. And, and I think I've always said that. And I think that I love to hear that statement that you just made just now. It, it's when you say rig, right? It's almost like you intentionally, you know what I mean? It's not by happenstance that this, that, 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 that this is going on. You, he intentionally rigged the system for us to win. That's right. Pastor Dave, you were about to say something. No, no, that, that, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say uh, something similar to that. Is that um, th th that's the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that in order for you to be lost, you have to literally reject me. If I stand up and come to you on your behalf, you gotta basically tell me, "Yo, go sit down. Yeah. I don't need no help." Yes. I, I literally have to, and and then still the hound of heaven pursues you. And that's the crazy thing about it. You know, even how many times we reject him, he still pursues. He still runs after. We literally, in order to be lost, have to be like, yo, we literally want nothing to do with you. That's wild because that is, isn't that, in the judgment, isn't that what, part of the rejection thing? You, you should already know what the judgment is going to bring forth. You should well, already, of, go ahead. Yeah, part of Satan's game is to make us believe it's on our own merit. So he reminds us, look at all that you have done. You'll never make it. And God's saying, wait a minute, I took all that. That's what the cross was about. So I'm not judging you on your performance. I'm judging you on your decision. Monkey wrench, monkey wrench. Then why are our deeds, monkey wrench, why are our deeds written there then? We're talking about the written book, right? Why is it there? Somebody help me. Because it's rigged. Because it's rigged and it's not about us, it's about God having proof that I've rigged this system. And this person still, despite my goodness, despite my pursuit, despite everything I wanted, he still chose differently. I believe that God has rigged this thing so much that in order for us to be lost, we have to get our name blotted out of his book of life. We all start out in his book of life. Um, Psalm 69, 28 tells us that the people who are lost get their name blotted out. So the book of deeds basically is showing, like uh, Dr. Defoe said, the book of deeds is showing, look at all that I have done to make sure you can't be lost. And you still fought me 
So I had to take your name out of a book that I had already put you in. So we're already on, we're already in positive. We're already, we're already on the good foot. That's we right. We want to take ourselves out. And it's all because Satan fools us into believing it's our performance that determines our, our destination. And it's not, it's Jesus' performance that determines our destination. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna double back. I'm gonna double back. I, I, I think this is great, but I need to double back for a second because we need, still need to touch on fear, okay? We still need to touch on fear. The reason why I want to go back to fear is because as much as we're talking about the blessed hope, um, sickness and death is still around us. Um, we still deal with the, the calamities of life. Uh, someone, a pastor from, I believe, the Atlanta area wrote me to tell me that his member died of the virus. Mm -hmm. um, how was the resurrection? something we've never seen, something mm -hmm. we've never heard of. I mean, when I say we've never heard of, we've studied about it. We, we, you know, we've seen Jesus' miracles concerning it. But how's the resurrection given us hope? How does it give us hope? Someone help me. For me, it reminds us this is not the end. This, if I die of the coronavirus, that's not the end. Resurrection says to me, the rigged game on my side, I accept Christ as my savior. The coronavirus gets me, but God's gonna get me in the end. Pastor Dave, help. Yeah, that, that. Remember the resurrection. This, we experience pain. We experience difficulty in this world. And life can throw you curveballs. We can't control it, right? The only thing we can control is how we build character here on this earth, right? We go to sleep. Christ comes back. He comes back for us. The, the, the fear is removed, not in that I don't have to be, not that I can't have fear as I walk through this journey. I can have fear. Um, the f fear is healthy. Doubt is not healthy, but fear is very healthy. Um, I can be afraid of coronavirus. I don't have to say, um, well, you know, I can go out into the street and not worry because I have the hope of a blessed re resurrection. God does not want us to be stupid in preparation for him resurrecting us, but we can, we can have faith to believe that the exigent circumstances we get ourselves into, that it's not the final story. It's not the final, it's not the final nail it, uh, that, there's another, there's another portion of the story. There's an act too, there's a part two um, that God is coming to take his people home, that he's coming back for us. Um, and so that's the, that's, the fear, that, that's the fear abatement that we have is that if we do die, while we don't wanna die, if we do die, Christ is coming back. We do have that blessed hope. Let me jump in here real quick. Miss Cynthia, uh, not to put your private business on, but you were supposed to be in Europe. Wow. Yes, right. it certainly was. So and, well, the reason why I'm saying that is because the resurrection, what I'm understanding from my two, my two colleagues here is that our behavior um, um, is modified based on the hope of the resurrection. There's something, there's a part two, there's something coming. And the reason why I brought up the vacation is because knowing that you were going on this vacation, right? There has to be some type of, uh, I, I don't know, Dave, if I'm using this word right, a behavioral change, an attitude that you're having coming towards this vacation. In the lesson, it kind of talks about nothing else really matters. So for example, let's say like at work, right? We all work together. There's good and bad that happens at work in every job that we have. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of say to yourself, well, my vacation is coming up. I'm gonna let that pass or some, you, you know what I mean? Help me with how a vacation or how this part two that's coming up can kind of change our mindset for hope. But you know, for me, yeah, it was disappointing. And initially we were planning supposed to be in Europe. I could have wallowed when the trip was canceled, 
way back in the fall. I could have wallowed in that and been miserable, but I was led the day that we should have been leaving. All I could say was, look at God. He already knew what was going to be coming down. If we had gone ahead and put all that money out, we might have been out of all of that money. We have to come into life with that same assurance that we may not see it today, but even in our fear, living through it, knowing that on the all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And the reality of fear in the resurrection is if I don't believe that Jesus has come through the resurrection, then all of this, all of this is in vain. Mm -hmm. So just as sure and real as his resurrection should be the establishment of my faith in that he rose, I'm going to rise. Listen, I don't want to heavy up. Oh, go ahead, Dave, real quick. Go ahead. No, I, I was just saying that, that that's the beauty of the visible hand of God. And I call it the visible hand of God because his hand isn't invisible. Like while we can't see him working at the end, after it's worked out, we can see where his hand moved. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the beauty of it. We don't understand what's going on. Like um, even the idea that this coronavirus has taken people off the street in Venice and it has restored fish and dolphins to the Venice Canal, yeah. just because we people who are supposed to be stewards of the earth are now out of the way. We don't see where God is moving. We don't see if this is God helping us to see once again or to relationship with him that I've tried, I've set all kinds of measures. Well, now let me send this so that maybe you'll start to call on me because time is coming, time is coming to an end. Yeah. Jack? Jack? Well, I have to say amen to what I just heard. <laughs> I, I don't know that I could even add to that. No, I, and, and, and it's true. I think personally, you know, I know this was a joke that I put on Facebook. I, you know, I have a lot of satire stuff on Facebook, but I have an upside down door. Um, uh, do you see it, Pastor, Pastor Dave, oh, my, my thing? Um, I've been living in this house for 15 years. And I pass this door every single day. Every day I pass this door. And now I, I, I look at this door and see that one of the doors, you know, it's a double door. One of the doors is upside down. Now I'm kind of thinking to myself, I didn't see this for, I, I've had snow days now. I've been inside for snow days, <laughs> but I've, I have not seen this door until 15 years later that the coronavirus is keeping me inside my house, giving me the opportunity to look at the minute stuff that we need to deal with. So Dave, you're right. When you talk about what's going on in Venice, it's all in our lives that we're able now to do introspection on our lives to find out what is it that we need that this virus is, is helping us with, whether or not people think that this is something that was, is the witch's brew or something that we have put together. I don't wanna talk about all of that. You are right, Miss Cynthia. God, we uh, uh, and 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 Dave, the visible hand of God. What we see later on, uh, uh, Jack. I want to throw something at you real quick because you brought it up. You were going through something in your life, and um, that means then for you and Miss Cynthia, who was thirty years old, and said, "Hey, God, there has to be a waiting time." Am I right? I would agree. There, there, and and this time for me was to. I would say this is what made my calling and election sure. I got to the point where I made a solid decision. I thought I had made the decision before, but all this pressure showed me that I hadn't. <laughs> so uh, when I made this final decision, now come what may, and I've gone through some more stuff since then, but I didn't go through the same way. I didn't go through with frustration with God. I went through this time, and I'm sure there's more to come, but I'll go through it with a calm assurance. I know what that means now. I, 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 I hear you. Um, it, it's just some of us may lose our faith during the waiting time. 
I, I don't care how short the time is. I don't care how long the time is. You know, I, I don't, I, again, when Dave was talking about timing, you know, we have a bad misconception of how God looks at it. I'm, I'm that person that, that believed that God made time to put Satan in it. That's what I believe because, um, because he made him in eternity. So he had to make him in time so that when he destroys, he is not necessarily destroying Satan, but he's destroying time and Satan is in that time. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get all, all like that, but that's, that's my belief structure with this thing called time. Um, many of us go through things. Um, I, I think of bad times in my own life when I th th think about my son and Asperger's and the guilt. What did I do in the past that allowed this to happen? And, and, and am I doing this right, that right? No, I, I think of so many different things. And now I look at him now and say, God, thank you for answering prayers. I didn't see it happening at that point, but I thank you for answering prayers and whichever. I, I think the waiting time, and this, I don't want to get too heavy into the prophetic part of it, the Pope and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the, the church. And I, I don't want to get too heavy on the Reformation right now. But there are many people who died during the Reformation, uh, many who didn't make it through during the Reformation, who's waiting on the, um, on the resurrection, <laughs> right? Of course, their calling and their election is sure on their last breath. Um, as, as we're coming down to the landing of this Sabbath school lesson, we are all in a waiting time. And I need to hear from three of us, uh, from the three of us when, when we're talking about this waiting time, because that's where we are right now. No matter where we are looking through this lesson of what we've studied through it and this discussion through it, we're all sitting in a tarrying and a waiting time. Um, man, someone is gonna push all the way down to the end of this lesson. And I want us to give, I want all three of us, and I'm gonna start with Cynthia, I'm going to go to Dave and I'm going to go up to attorney. Help me make it through this waiting time. Remember, this whole thing is about dust to stars. Okay. I want to keep into a mentality. This whole thing is from dust to stars. There's something else coming. Now that we're here in this waiting time, help me. Miss Cynthia, help me through this. I challenge you, don't try to take the whole journey one day at a time. If you can trust God, you can trust God for one day. And when you get through that day and you wake up the next morning, you realize, ooh, this is another day. So if you just take the journey one day at a time. Thank you. I, and I really appreciate that. I'm sure I'm speaking for someone who's watching and saying, well, how, how do I make it? I'm an introvert. Thank you for that. I'm an introvert, so I like being home. You know, I like being here. I just don't like being here because somebody say I gotta be here, but I still like being here, um, being home. But thank you, because it's not Sunday, it's Friday. It's not Monday, it's Sabbath, it's not Tuesday. So live in the day and take it one day at a time. That's what I got from you just now. You take it one day at a time. Help me, Dr. Dave, help me. Yeah, I, I think that for me, it it's letting people know that God shelters us in times of trouble. You know, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. But, but he, he, he delivers us in, in the end. You know, Isaiah uh, 43, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, mm -hmm. they, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, mm -hmm. you will not be burnt. I, I think one version even says you won't even come out smelling like smoke. Um, you know, God's got us. Uh, he's, he's, he's had been with us in the past that this is not something that's too hard for God. Um, that, that, that God, that God knows what he's doing. And in the end, God will stand up and it'll be over. Thanks Dave. I really appreciate that. Um, it's sobering. It's sobering. Um, again, yesterday, last night when I got the letter through Facebook, through a very brave Northeastern conference president, very brave to be able to put that out there. Um, it, it, it got, it, it got me another guy that I went to school with at Oakwood, uh, he, he contracted it. Um, you know, it, it, it's all turns different now when you know somebody, you know, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not something you're seeing on the news. It's, it's really right next door. Now you're caring about, not caring, but now you're thinking about your parents. Now you're thinking about what's, what's happening with people around you. And not just trying to be funny, but we're all getting up there in age where we have to take care of our 
we should have been doing this anyway, washing our hands, doing what we're supposed to do anyway. But I thank God for that, uh, uh, Pastor Dave. He's there with us. He's never left us nor forsaken us. I, I even love the, the, the Bible verse that says, even if you lay your bed in hell, hell. Mm -hmm. I'm still there. he's there. Uh, um, um, not telling us to lay your bed in hell. I'm just saying wherever we are, there's, there's help towards it. Attorney Jack, help us real quick as we come down to our close. For me, this waiting time is an opportunity to slow down. We live life so quickly and give, giving ourselves an opportunity to slow down and intentionally take time with God to get to know who he is and what he means in our own life. Just take some time that normally wouldn't because of the rat race of life. But here we are, we're sequestered in our homes, we're, we're not doing all the things that we normally do. Take some time and just get to know God, read the Bible, listen to his voice through the word of God and see where you are in your relationship with him. And you'll find out in my view, you will find out how valuable your relationship with God really is. Wow. Well, you know, uh, thanks everybody. I, 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 I thought that this was great for us to come together. Um, and um, the hymn that comes to my mind, I'm not going to sing it. The hymn that comes to my mind is, it's almost time for the Lord to come. Mm. I hear the people say, the stars of heaven are growing dim. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. I'm just thinking of of the waiting time, right? Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. It must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. I don't want to hold you, but it says the signs foretell in the sun and moon, in earth and sea and sky, allow proclaim to all mankind the coming of the master draweth nigh. Here's the third verse. It must be time for the waiting church to cast her pride away with mm. girded loins and burning lamps to look forward for the breaking of the day. So go quickly out in the streets and lanes and in the broad highway and call the maimed, Dave, this is the gospel side of it, right? Mm -hmm. And call the maimed, the halt and blind to be ready. Isn't that why we're doing this? Okay. To call everybody to be ready for the breaking of the day. I wanna thank yeah. everybody for their time. And um, I'm, I'm also asking for us to hold on. We do have a, um, uh, after a beautiful song that's going to uh, be sung, I just ask you to hold on for a 30 minute um, uh, 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 a message by Dr. Doggett. I want to thank you for that. And if we take the time out now, uh, Miss Cindy, if you'll pray us out, is that okay? That's fine. Awesome. awesome. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord, with peace and assurance of your presence, we just want to thank you that you're our God. We want to thank you, Lord, as David said, that you have created time and permitted us to be a part of this time. We want to thank you for the knowledge that you are our blessed assurance that you're with us, you will carry us through this. And so we would ask for all of this listening congregation, mm your peace for this day in this time in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thanks everybody. God bless you till the next time. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world or my fondest dreams. I have renounced sin and all of its pleasures. Jesus is mine. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, 
All my habits of life Though harmless they seem Must not my heart From him ever sever He is my all There's nothing between Not even my trials Though this whole world against me Convene Watching with prayer and much self-denial Triumph at last With nothing between I surrender all I surrender all yes all to thee my I surrender all to your will, all to your way, God, everything. There's nothing between, nothing between, nothing, nothing, no, nothing, no. You gave me the victory. You gave me victory And I thank you I thank you I thank you Lord You took it away You took it away So there is nothing No nothing Between Hallelujah Hallelujah Jesus I surrender I surrender Hello friends, this is Jackson M. Doggett Jr. I have come to deliver a word from the Lord. The title of my message today is, Why Did Jesus Come to the Earth? 
Why did Jesus come to the earth? Let's bow our heads and pray as we prepare to share the word of God. Father, we ask that you would teach us the truth so that the truth will set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Why did Jesus come to the earth? The book of Genesis chapter 3 tells us about the story of the fall of mankind. Eve and Adam both disobeyed God and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As a result of eating from that tree, Jesus kicked them out of the garden, but before he did, he told them that there would be a redemption plan, a plan where sin would be destroyed, where humankind can be saved and restored back to paradise. But someone might be asking, what do we need to be saved from? From what? Do we need to be saved? Well, John 8, 31 to 36, I'm reading the New Living Translation of the Bible. It says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Matthew 121 says, and she will have a son and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What are we being saved from? Sin. How did this happen? Well, John 3, 17 puts it this way. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. I like the way the King James Version says it. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Well, why does Jesus need to save us from sin? Romans 3.23 tells us, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of or free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. So Romans 3, 23 tells us everyone has sinned. And Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Revelation 21, 8. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt murderers and immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, you're going to see several deaths. The second death is that death from which nobody will wake up. I can explain that, but that's not the real point of the message today. What I want to say about the second death is Revelation 2, 11 says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. So Jesus came into the world not to condemn, but to save. Save from what? Sin. What is sin? John, 1 John 3, 4 tells us, everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. I learned this in the King James Version, so I'm going to quote it. I like that version. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. 
But you might ask, what law? It's the Ten Commandment law. We know this because Romans 7, 7 says, well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. In other words, the writer of Romans is saying, we know what law we cannot break and make it to paradise restored because the law tells us, and as an example he uses here in Romans 7, 7, the law tells us that coveting is wrong. I wouldn't have even known it, but the law that tells us that coveting is wrong. What law tells us that? You read from Genesis to Revelation, you will find it's the Ten Commandment law. So Jesus came to save us from sin. Sin is breaking God's law. What law are we talking about? The Ten Commandment law. Now, there are people who say that uh, the law of God was nailed to the cross. It couldn't have possibly been nailed to the cross because if there was no law, there would be no sin. If there is no sin, there's no need for a savior. If there's no need for a savior, why are we trying to have a relationship with a savior, Jesus Christ? The law was not nailed to the cross. I'll tell you what was really nailed to the cross. It was the accusation of the sins that were against us. That was nailed to the cross through Jesus Christ. Once again, that's a whole nother story, but what I can tell you is that Christ took our sin so that we don't have to pay the penalty for sin. But Jesus came to earth. Why did he come? To save us from sin. What is sin? The transgression or the breaking of God's law. What law are we talking about? The Ten Commandment law. So there are both sins of commission, that is actively doing wrong, and there are sins of omission. That's not doing what is right. I'm going to say that again. There are two kinds of sin. There is the sin of commission, that is doing something wrong, and there is the sin of omission, that is not doing what is right. Well, where did you get this sin of omission from? James 4 and verse 17 says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So there is the sin of commission, transgressing or breaking the law of God. There is the sin of omission, that is knowing what you ought to do, but not doing it. So how do we order our lives in line with God's will? Well, first we need to remember that's what we ought to do. Ordering our lives to God's will means that we avoid the sins of commission and the sins of omission by living in line with God's instructions. When we live in line with God's instructions, we don't have to worry about committing sin or committing sin based on what we should have done but did not. James 2.12 tells us, so whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. King James says it this way, so speak ye and do ye as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Remember, you can commit sins of commission and sins of omission, but Jesus came to earth to save us from sin, which is the transgression of his law or failing to do what he's asked us to do that is right. We must order our lives in line with what Jesus wants us to do. But how do we change our way of thinking, acting, and deciding? Here we are. 
I told you the Bible says that all have sinned. Everyone has sinned. So Jesus had to save us from our sin because we all have committed sin. How do we change our way of thinking, acting, and deciding so that we're not committing sins of omission or sins of commission? How do we change our mind? Philippians 2.5 tells us, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Again, I like the way the King James Version says it. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do we get the mind of Christ Jesus in us? That's a very important question. How do we do it? Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 tells us how we can do it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How do we get the mind of Christ in us? It comes in us through the washing of the water of the word. I read those three texts or verses, so you got the context around it. Because the Bible is saying, husbands, you ought to love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How do we get the mind of Christ inside of us? Let this attitude be in you. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus so that you can walk in line with the will of God, live your life in line with the will of God. How do I get the mind of Christ in me? is through the washing of the water of his word. In other words, we must read the Bible to learn to establish the attitude that Christ had, especially read the New Testament, especially read the Gospels, especially read the book of John, which was written so that we might believe in Jesus. If we understand how Jesus thought and responded and acted and made sure that he was in line with the will of God, his Father, if we would follow that and allow the thoughts from that to come into us, we will get the attitude, the mind of Christ in us. When we get the mind of Christ in us, we are in a position where we can walk like Jesus walked, where we can stay in line with the will of God, where we can avoid sins of commission and avoid sins of omission because the mind of Christ is in us so that we are walking according to the will of God, who has, by the way, a wonderful plan for your life. The thing that's messing up our life is sin. The antidote for sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we accept the free sacrifice he has given, we can once again walk in that wonderful life that God has planned for us. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Jesus wants to save every sinner. I mentioned all have sinned. Jesus wants to save every sinner, which means Jesus wants to save you. Why did he come to the earth? To save us from sin, which is the transgression of God's law, which is walking outside of the will of God, but we have the opportunity to be able to do it when we get the mind of Christ in us, 
We get the mind of Christ in us through the washing of the water of the word. As I am speaking this message, we are in the midst of a crisis. COVID-19 is sweeping the globe. We are uh, sequestered in our homes and we're practicing social distancing and we're having to change how our lives have gone. But there's one blessing in this sequester, if you will, and that is some time we can take to get the mind of Christ in us through the washing of the water of the word. We can take some time to understand what Christ wants for our life. We can read the Bible. We can see how Jesus thought and acted and responded. We can decide that we're going to allow the attitude of Christ to become our attitude because Jesus wants to save every sinner. I know this because Luke 15 verses 1 through 7 says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now I pause to say that's a sad commentary. When teachers of the religious law are having problems when sinners are coming to hear Jesus teach, that's a problem. But I want to say to you, when you have the opportunity to go back to church, and right now as I speak, churches across the United States and around the globe are closed. You can't go. And if you go, you have to stay in your car. You can't go in. There's social distancing. But I'm here to tell you, when you get back, don't be surprised that some of the teachers of religious law have a problem that sinners show up. Don't be surprised. If you're that sinner, show up anyway, because Jesus gladly welcomes sinners. He came to earth to save sinners. So I go back to the verse, verse three. So Jesus told them a story. Who was he talking to? the religious leaders who were having a problem with sinners coming to hear Jesus teach. Jesus told them, those religious leaders, a story. This is what he said. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who re repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Look at the beautiful story Jesus told in response to indignance by the religious leaders. They were indignant because sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him preach. Jesus said, listen, what would you do if only one out of a hundred of your sheep is lost? What would you would do is leave the 90 and nine, go find that lost sheep. And when that lost sheep is found, there will be more joy over one lost sheep than over the 99 that remain. Jesus said the same thing in heaven. When one sinner is saved by the grace of God, there is joy in heaven over the one more than over the 99 who are righteous and have not strayed away. Jesus came to save sinners from sin to be restored back to paradise with him. John 3, 16 and 17 is a very familiar text. 
New Living Translation says it this way, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world or condemn the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Of course, I like the King James way of saying it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a beautiful thought. All of us have sinned, but all of us can be saved. Jesus came to the earth to save sinners from sin. What is sin? The transgression of the law. What law? The law of liberty. What law is that? The Ten Commandment law. That law that tells us what is right and what is wrong. And Jesus said, I have come to save you from that from sins of commission, that is doing wrong, breaking the law, and sins of omission, that is not doing what you know to do right and just don't do it. He says, I've come to save from all of that. And when a person accepts the sacrifice of Jesus, there is more joy in heaven over that one person than over all the people who have not made those mistakes. That doesn't say that Jesus doesn't love and care and, and rejoice over those who haven't made mistakes, but he's saying, my purpose for coming to the earth was to make sure everyone who wants to can be saved in God's kingdom. That person can be you. So in these uncertain times, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God? Jesus says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Why did Jesus come to, your, to earth? Jesus came to earth to save sinners from their sin and the consequences of those sins, which is eternal death. Who is a sinner? Everyone, before they accept the saving grace of Jesus Christ, Jesus came to save us from our sins and to restore us to paradise. So with this assurance, don't be troubled in these troubled times. We know that Jesus went to the cross. That old rugged cross, there's an old song that says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best of a world for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cling to the old rugged cross and my trophies at last I'll lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we are living in light as God is the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. My friend, I have presented to you the basic gospel, the good news of the kingdom. God created the world. Genesis 1 tells us about it. 
Eve and Adam sinned. Genesis 3 tells us about it. Jesus came into the world to save us from sin. That includes you. Sin is the transgression of the law, omission, commission. Jesus says, but I can change the way you live your life if you will let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that attitude that was in you. My friends, the first step is your salvation. Here's what you do. You simply say, Jesus, I recognize I am a sinner. I want to be saved. Apply your grace to my life. Because you must remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourself, it's a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't have to get right to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus so he can get you right. And then you begin to develop your relationship with him through the reading of the word, through the word being the Bible, through the reading of the Bible, through looking at the life of Jesus Christ, by accepting his attitude, by learning how to act and react, how to stay in line with God's will, how to spend time with God. And then when you continue in that way, you're not doing it to become saved. You're saved by grace. When you say, Lord, save me, you're saved by grace. Now you begin to learn how to walk like Jesus walked, how to stay in the will of God, how to have the mind that Christ has. And when you have done that, one of these days, he's coming back. I don't know what's going to happen through this pandemic called coronavirus, COVID-19. I don't know how it's going to affect you or your family members, but this I do know. One day, soon and very soon, Jesus will break through the clouds and he will come and he will save us from our sins. We'll be able to raise our hands and say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Despite what you go through, Christ is with you. And one day, paradise lost will be paradise regained again. Do you want that for yourself? Then pray with me. Jesus, save us from our sin. Apply your blood to me and give me your grace that I might be saved in your kingdom. And now that I am saved in your kingdom, help me to establish the mind of Christ through the washing of the water of the word by reading the Bible on a daily basis, not to get saved, but to understand how to have the attitude of Christ and to walk in line with God's will for my life. Thank you for those blessings that you are giving to me even now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. My friend, I don't know what your personal needs are, but I know who can fix it. His name is Jesus, and I recommend to you from this day forward that you would be sure to walk with him. God bless you as you continue to walk with God.